Well, good morning. Welcome to Renolda Church. If I haven't had a chance to meet you before, my name is Chris. I serve as our executive pastor. We're so glad you're with us today. If you're joining us at our Union Cross campus, welcome there. If you're at the Ascent on the Village campus, we're glad you're joining us to worship there. Maybe you're joining us online today. I have a friend of mine who's a doctor, and one day he was taking his four-year-old daughter uh, to preschool. He left, left his stethoscope laying across the car seat in the back of the car, and he saw his daughter pick up that stethoscope and begin to play with it, and he thought, oh, be still my heart, my little precious daughter. She wants to follow in her father's footsteps and become a doctor, and his heart swelled with pride. The next thing he knew, she had picked up that stethoscope, held it up to her mouth, and said, welcome to McDonald's. May I take your order? <laughs> you know, all of us have these grandiose ideas about what our children may become when they grow up. Or maybe you had those ideas about yourself. Today we're going to continue with our series called The Beauty of Balance. The Beauty of Balance comes from one of our principles as a church. We want to believe what Jesus believed about himself. Jesus was full of grace and full of truth. And we as a church have tried to be a church that's full of grace and full of truth. And we think that trickles down into lots of uh, other areas in our lives. And so over the last several weeks, we've been looking at some things like being full of word and spirit, gifts and fruit, spirit and intellect, all and intimacy, celebration and contemplation. And today we're going to move our attention to work and rest. Are you ready for some good news? God created us to work hard and rest well. Both are his ideas, and both are good, very good. This last week, our family spent some time doing a little vocational training with our six-year-old daughter, Ellie. See, Ellie, when she grows up, has decided that she wants to be a princess, so this week we spent a little time doing some vocational training with Ellie at Disney World. Now, Disney World's a fun place to go in October because it's the Halloween, fall, autumn season there. And so lots of kids are dressed up. And it was so much fun to walk through there in the evenings and see all the kids' great costumes and all of the ways that those costumes in some ways probably reflected who they want to be when they grow up. There were some of the more traditional fare, right, superheroes and princesses, but then a lot of other things we saw and noticed, dancers and pilots and firefighters and police officers and lots of astronauts and lots of detectives there at Disney World this week. You know, ingrained in the fabric of our American identity is the idea of what some might call a Protestant work ethic. This was a phrase that was coined by the sociologist who lived sometime in the 17th century, Max Weber. He was a German sociologist and political economist who believed that the reform tradition had an emphasis on hard work as a component of a person's calling and worldly influence. He believed that the very nature of the founding of this country there was a new world Christian identity that must be reflected upon and was something unique found in the Americas. Now, at some point, though, for all of us, the idea of vocation or work becomes a burden or maybe you even consider it a curse. This is not unlike what you might find in the first century when Jesus lived. If you read Homer, the Greek philosopher, you will notice that he depicted God as someone who hated the people he had created. That God in Homer's eyes was someone who was threatened by his creation because they may take over rule from him. And thus he cursed humanity with the burden of work. Yet this view of work stands in direct contrast to what we find in Scripture. And so today I'm going to take us through a lot of Scripture together. We're going to begin today in Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 through 31. Genesis chapter 1. 
So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the ground, everything that has the breath of life. I have given every green plant for food. I acknowledge that for some of us, we're in a place where we're either out of work or underemployed or maybe you're on the other side of the spectrum and instead of being without work or without enough work you're overworked maybe that's something within you that says you don't measure up and so you work and work and work or your job requires you to work more hours or maybe you're a family that someone in the household has to work multiple jobs but the beginning of developing what I might call a theology of work begins with the idea that work is a gift. Work was God's idea from the beginning. And we see this because we know that God was a worker. The phrase work of God shows up multiple times throughout the entire narrative of Scripture. We see God the Father at work in creation. We see God the Father at work in His providence, working all things together for our good and His glory. We see God at work in the sustaining of creation, meaning there are things that it looks as if God himself is sustaining and providing for the needs of creation. God is at work in salvation through his covenants, revealing to the world his redemptive grace. God the Father is a worker, and so is his only begotten Son, Jesus the Christ. Jesus is a worker. In John 9, 4, we read the words of Jesus when he says, We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. We know that Jesus was involved in creation because the Bible says at the beginning of Genesis, when they're talking about creation, it says, Let us make them in our image. In theology, this is called Imago Dei, that we were made in the image of God. But what's more interesting here is the plural use of us. It is widely agreed upon that this is the Trinity communicating between itself in holy community, saying, let us together, Jesus is present at creation. In John 1, we read echoes of that same promise from Genesis when it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Colossians tells us in the writing of Paul that Jesus himself is holding together creation. In physics, we learn about something that physicists might call the strong force, the very thing that's keeping the most minute part of the creation, the atom, from destroying itself because the positively influenced parts of that atom should rip it apart. But they say there's a strong force holding it together. Colossians tells us that the strong force has a name. His name is Jesus. There's no work of God in the world that Jesus isn't involved in. As example, consider God's redemptive work to bring people back to himself through his only son, Jesus. God the Father is a worker. Jesus the Son is a worker. And so is the Holy Spirit. We see in Genesis that the Spirit of God is hovering over the waters. And it is the power of the Holy Spirit that empowers believers for God's work. It is the very deposit of God's Spirit in us that empowers us to do good works in the world. Jesus says, I am going to go and send one back so that you can get about my work in the world. And through faith in Jesus, our spirits are given new life. And the spirit of Jesus now lives in us so that he can work through us. The Holy Spirit is a worker working out his desires through the people of God. So God is a worker and we are created in the image of that worker. But you might say, well, 
isn't it true that one of the parts of the fall, one of the curses of the fall is work itself? Don't you remember that when God cursed Adam, he did so by telling him that he'd have to fight the soils and the thorns of the ground? God did say that, but he did not in doing so make work the curse. The nature of work changed, but work is still a gift from God. As illustration, consider this. Through the same sin of Adam, childbirth became painful. My wife is the toughest person I've ever met, and I've never been so sure of that as I was the day that we almost had our third child in the car on the way to the hospital. It was unbelievable. Like, we're on our way, we're having contractions, and she's tough. Like, I am soft. If I have a sore throat, I'm down for three weeks. If she gets her arm cut off, she's ready to go the next day. She's just tough. She almost couldn't get in the car that day. We're having, we're having contractions. She's having contractions. I'm trying to keep it on the road. She says we're not going to make it. We get into the hospital. The nurse says, how close are you? And she checks to see how close we are. And she said, we got to get you back right now. No epidural, no drugs, baby coming out. My wife is tough, and I know that. And that toughness is required because of the sin of Adam. But no one would say that our baby Zachary isn't a gift. See, the childbirth, the pain of the childbirth, is the result of the sin. But the baby is still a gift from God. The pain of the work is often a result of sin. But the work itself is a gift from God. And so work is a gift, and God commanded His people to work. And because God commanded for us to work, it invests dignity into that work. We are still doing what we were created to do, and that is to subdue, to steward the creation. God says, take the animal kingdom and subdue it. Utilize the creation that I've given you. Steward it. Care for it. Be blessed by the thing that I've created for you. Have dominion over it. Name the animals. And work is a part of God's plan of redemption. Psalm 104 says, He made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows it's time for setting. You make darkness and it is night when all the beasts of the forest creep about. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they steal away and lie down in their dens. Man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. We are called to work because it is noble and it is God glorifying. Now, the purpose of speaking about a theology of work is not to devalue the many jobs in our culture that are uncompensated. You know, many of the jobs that are uncompensated are in fact the most valuable jobs in our world. I believe the work I do as a pastor is important work and the thing that God created me to do. But in the end, I don't think it is nearly as valuable as the work my wife does. Cares for our home and cares for our children. Takes care of their needs. Helps them to become more like Jesus every day. When I talk about a theology of work or a theology of vocation, I'm not talking about things that are compensated. When I talk about vocation, I mean it in the broadest sense. Anything that God has gifted you uniquely to do and without you will not happen. That's what vocation is. God has gifted you uniquely to do it and without you, that which God has created you to do will not happen. And so work is not about payments. It's about using gifts to contribute to God's wider work in the world. So why does God give us the gift of work? 
The first reason is, is that I believe that God has given us something called a cultural mandate. This is the idea that since we are created in God's image, this leads to our directly having the privilege and duty to subdue the earth. God creates the earth, calls it good, places us on the earth, and then says, go out and subdue the earth. It means that human vocation, human work, involves, involves exercising the authority that God gave us over his creation for his good purposes. Humans, we are created in the image of God and are endowed, given the traits of God that fit into his story of being createful, creative, useful, joyous workers. Of all the things that I believe are true about a biblical worldview, I believe this almost supersedes all of the other things I believe. That God has given us a cultural mandate. We talk about there being basically two ways to live in the world. One way is to be a separatist. To believe that the culture is evil and thus those who believe in Jesus should flee from the culture, become separatists, <clears throat> excuse me, and thus wait until the time in which Jesus will return. That to get involved in the world is to be influenced by the culture and thus be polluted by the culture. This is not the proclamation that Paul speaks over the believers in the New Testament. Paul says to be in the world, but not of the world. It is the Christian's responsibility, duty, and privilege to live in the world that God created. And even when we feel like we're losing our influence on the culture, it is at that moment that we don't flee, we go in deeper. God has created us to do his work in the world and to shape all spheres of the culture. No one in human history has shaped the culture like the Christian church. The reason that slavery no longer exists in the way that it did for thousands of years is because Christians found it to be inconsistent with what the Bible said about human dignity and fought against it. The reason that hospitals and nursing exist is because we believed that Jesus was the great physician and we should act out his healing presence in the world. That's a Christian idea. Almost every major university in America was started by a believer who thought it was the responsibility of the Christian church to train people in the liberal arts and in biblical knowledge. And so send your children to us and we'll teach them about Jesus. Colleges, universities, hospitals, libraries, charities, like the Red Cross and the Salvation Army, those weren't the culture's ideas, those were followers of Jesus' ideas. Jesus has called us into the world. And for some reason, we're running a little scared. We're running a little anxious. We're a little nervous that that which we proclaim about the sovereignty of Jesus over all things may not be true. And when your faith drops, your fear increases. It is natural for us to grieve that which has been lost. But we do not grieve as people who have no hope. If anything is consistently true 
throughout Christian history is that God's purposes always prevail. Always prevail. As your pastor, as your friend, as someone who loves you, let me tell you that now more than ever, the culture needs us to press into it. Because in the end, those who believe that Jesus was raised from the dead are the only ones who have true hope to offer. Don't flee. Run towards them. And say there is a better way. There is a God who loved you so much that He sent His only begotten Son who died in your place for your sins so you could have victory over life and death. God has called the church of Jesus Christ to be the city on a hill. To be the light that chases away darkness. We have a cultural mandate from the creator of the universe to subdue all spheres. Not just the religious one, but all spheres. Because every good idea is God's idea. And it is His plan through the work of Jesus to redeem all things. This may be our moment to have more influence than we've ever had in Christian history. Because everybody wants to know what the problem is and everyone wants to know what the solution is the problem is sin and the solution is Jesus the second reason that God gives us work is to provide for our needs God gives us work to provide for our legitimate needs when Adam and Eve sinned God imposed on the human race a condition of hardship that continually reminds us that we rejected His provision for us. And now we provide for ourselves. When Adam and Eve were in the garden, God said, you can eat of anything that's here except for of the one tree. I will provide for all of your needs. I'll be your sustainer. Satan convinced them that they didn't need authority, so they rejected authority, and in the end got what they wanted, which is to live and exist outside of God's provision. And then God says, you're on your own. I'm going to make a way for you to do it, but you have to provide for your own needs. You have to till the ground and you have to make sure that your family is provided for. The third reason that God gives us work is so that we can be generous. We work so that we can give it away. 1 Timothy 5, 8, Paul speaks to children and grandchildren regarding the aged widows. He says, but if anyone does not provide for his relative and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. We are to work hard so that we can give away not just our treasure, not just our money, but we're to work hard so that we can give away our time, our treasure, and our talent. Maybe you don't have money, but you have a unique talent that you can give away to the world. Give it away. Maybe you don't have a unique talent or maybe you don't have a unique treasure, but maybe you have time that God has given you that you can sit with a widow who is by herself, or rock a baby who doesn't have a parent. God has given us the heart of generosity so that we can give away that which we work for. Structure your life in such a way that you have lots of time, lots of treasure, and lots of talent to give away to God's world. And the fourth way is to leverage your influence. God gives us work as a way of leveraging our relationships for the gospel. It is our work in the world that puts us in the best position to rub shoulders with those who are non-believers. I've said this to you before. Many of you have a better opportunity to share the gospel with the world than I ever will have. I spend most of my Sundays talking to people who already believe in Jesus. You live in the world with people who need the hope of the calling and the kingdom that you have found. 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 and 12, Paul challenges the believers to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we 
instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. God gave us the gift of work as a cultural mandate to run towards that which is dark so that we can be the light. God gave us the gift of work so that we may provide for our needs. God gave us the gift of work so that we can be generous, giving away our time, treasure, and talent. And God gave us the gift of work so that we can leverage our influence with the world so that in the relationships that God has put us in, when they see the way that we love our kids and speak about our spouses and care for the poor, the fruit of the new life that God has given us becomes a testimony that there is hope for their story too. But in the end, it's not just about work. It's about finding balance. Work hard, absolutely, to God's glory and for your joy. But rest well, too. Luke 6, 1. On a Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, (coughs) rubbing them together in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? The Jewish halakha, which is a collective body of Jewish religious laws, said that reaping grain on the Sabbath was one of the 39 forms of work that was prohibited on the Sabbath day. Now on the surface, that seems like pure legalism. 39 rules about all the things that you shouldn't be doing on the Sabbath. And it feels like, to be consistent with the way that Jesus rejects legalism throughout all the Gospels, that Jesus would in fact rebuke them for telling them, his disciples, what to do on the Sabbath. But instead of Jesus saying the thing which we might anticipate Jesus would say, which would be, the Son of Man came to abolish the Sabbath, Jesus says something else. Jesus said to say, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus seems to be saying here, Jesus seems to be confirming that he is all in on the Sabbath. He doesn't reject it. He confirms the role of rest in his kingdom. Now, our culture has an obsession with work. No culture, I bet, in the history of all cultures has been obsessed with work, quite like our culture. And there is an enormous amount of anxiety that accompanies our jobs. Some of it is is that job security is decreasing. My father has just retired from a job that he worked for 37 years. It's so infrequent now that you find people who work the same job their whole life with the changing nature of businesses. Many people get laid off and find jobs, and many people think that the only way to prove their merit to a company is to work as hard as they possibly can. Technology has changed the nature of our jobs because technology allows us to work from anywhere. We now work everywhere. I'm guilty of this. I work everywhere. It's not great. It's not healthy. Technology has allowed this. Technology, both a blessing, but also can become a curse. But cultural anthropologists have noted, and it's widely accepted, that until this civilization that we live in, that the meaning historically of your life was found in your family. And now, for the first time in this culture, people are finding their first level meaning, the thing that most identifies who they are, in their job. And so... Our out-of-balance work lives, a modern problem, actually has an ancient solution, the Sabbath. There is an ancient solution because, honestly, the idea of us needing to rest is actually an ancient problem. We've just ignored the need for rest. There's a great article called Bringing Back the Sabbath. It's written by... Um, someone who grew up Jewish. Her name is Judith Shulovitz. She writes this. When Sunday was still sacred, not only did drudgery give way to festivity, family gatherings, and occasional worship, but the machinery of self-censorship shut down. Two, 
stilling the eternal inner murmur of self-reproach. Stilling the eternal inner murmur of self-reproach. What does she mean? She says that within each of us, there is a desire to prove ourselves. Meaning, we don't think that what we've contributed is ever really enough. So, they accuse Jesus of breaking the Sabbath command to not glean from the field. And he responds this way, and Jesus answered them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him. How he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those with him. <clears throat> Jesus is referencing something that happens in 1 Samuel chapter 21. David enters into the holy place of the temple and takes what is called the showbread, the bread that was consecrated only for Sabbath worship. And what Jesus is pointing out here is that David is never punished or condemned by God for this. And Jesus wants the Pharisees to think about that. That David violated one of the Sabbath commands to not eat the showbread, and yet God doesn't punish him for that. If the Sabbath can be set aside, Jesus is suggesting here, in a bind, if in a bind we can set aside the Sabbath rules, but there is nowhere else in the Bible that the other moral law, meaning the other Ten Commandments, can be set aside. For instance, you can't say, hey, I was in a hurry, so I murdered someone or I stole something, right? You can't just set aside because you had a better idea the commandment to not commit adultery, right? You can't do that. But Jesus seems to be suggesting that in a bind, you can set aside the commandment about the Sabbath. I think what Jesus is saying is that if it is acceptable for in a bind for the Sabbath law, it tells us something about the Sabbath. What it's suggesting is, is that the Sabbath is a shadow in temporary, meaning they point to something or maybe someone who will fulfill its intention and make it obsolete. And Jesus answers the question of how. How is it possible that we can set aside the Sabbath? How is it possible that it is a shadow or a signpost pointing to a future reality? Jesus answers that question too when he says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He says, I'm going to give you rest. Let me show you this real quickly. God makes creation. And at the end of every day, he stops and says, See what I did? It is good. Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, he says, See what I have done. It is good. And then he does something else. Interesting, at the end of the sixth day. It says, it was so, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and morning on the sixth day. Very good means to be utterly satisfied. It is the only way you can walk away from, from the work you have done, is to be satisfied with it. God sees what he has done, day one, two, three, four, five, six, and he says it is very good because it is complete. The only way you can put down your work is to be satisfied with what you have done. God calls it very good. We can never do this because we can never look at what we have done and call it very good. This is why Hebrews 4, 9, and 10 says, So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. From his. When you see your work the way God sees his work, 
you can rest. Look at Luke 6, 11. This is at the end of Jesus instructing them about the Sabbath, saying that he's the Lord of the Sabbath. It then says, but they were filled with fury and disgust with one another what they might do to Jesus. Why are they furious? Because Jesus just called himself Lord of the Sabbath. He just called himself God. And so he had to die. And ironically, by them putting Jesus on the cross, they in fact made him Lord of the Sabbath. On the cross, in his suffering, in his restlessness, he becomes our rest. Isaiah 57, 20, But the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss us up, mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The internal murmuring that says to you day by day, you aren't good enough. Your work never is good enough. You could never do enough to be accepted, to be loved, to be the beloved of God. That internal murmuring is the reason that we never find rest. And that murmuring, that whispering, that proclamation by our enemy over you that says you're never good enough you've never done enough to rest jesus says i have conquered it i have taken your restlessness onto the cross and i have given you my rest jesus's victory gave us dominion in our work so that we could go out and subdue the world have victory over all spheres be generous with our time, provide for our needs, be an echo into eternity that God created us to subdue His creation. But Jesus also gave us victory over our restlessness. Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you peace. The Christian life is full of redemptive work, making all things new. But the Christian life is also full of peaceful rest. Because in the end, the enemy wants to tell you over and over and over again that you don't measure up. Jesus says, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. What he means is, is when they hung the only begotten Son of God on the cross, and in his restlessness, he cries out, It is finished. He is saying to all those who place faith in him, Come to me and find rest. Meaning, find peace from your labors. Find peace from your efforts to merit My grace. You no longer have to work for My grace. You no longer have to work for My acceptance. You no longer have to work to find peace. I have taken your restlessness and I have given you my peace and my righteousness. How does the gift of God's work come about in your life? You first find peace in the rest of your Savior so that the work becomes a joy and for God's glory. How do you find peace? How do you find balance between work and rest? You believe that the only begotten Son of God made your work redemptive by no longer making your peace about your work. Your work is now about your joy and God's glory in the world because you have found sweet rest of the Savior. And if you are a believer in Jesus today, drink deeply from the peace 
and rest of your Savior. Knowing that Jesus died in your place for your sins so that your work could be for your joy and His work could be for your redemption and you could find rest. And that is the gospel.